Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 247, featuring another installment of my interview with Mr. Robert Sirotech, one of the founders of Surtech Software. This part of the interview, we talk about Wizardry Bane of the Cosmic Forge, the Jagged Alliance series, uh, why Robert thinks that uh, Hollywood had no business uh, in the games industry in the 80s and 90s, and uh, finally, what led to uh, Surtech's withdrawal from the industry. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Sirotech. Okay, so we're up to Bane of the Cosmic Forge, 1990 game. I remember uh, seeing all the ads for this in the magazines, and it was just really fantastic stuff. Uh, EGA graphics, a big overhaul of the series, and it sounds like David Bradley was pretty much the, the one man behind all of this. You bet he was. He was the only guy behind it. Back in that day, you could still produce a video game as a one-man band. We were talking about shipping product on 3.5-inch discs, uh, I think, or maybe we were still doing the five-and-a-quarter-inch floppies. I don't know, but uh, it wasn't long before 3.5-inch discs were the medium of choice. We were shipping on six 3.5-inch uh, discs, the product, so there was a lot of content there. And uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of um, variable content. By that I mean, uh, you know, when the CD-ROM was introduced, there was uh, uh, music. Now that the, the the capacity of the disc was large enough to accommodate music, animation, um, still graphs, uh, certainly far larger storyboarding. And, and and plot lines and so forth. That's what I mean by multiple variables. And, and so that hadn't arrived yet. So David was working as a one-man band, producing wonderful product, well ahead of its time. And, and, and we worked well, to, very well together. He did this for number six. I think for number seven, the CD-ROM was introduced. All of a sudden now... There were new video standards happening. It went from CGA to VGA. That meant we needed artists because it was becoming more complicated to produce professional quality art to a standard that was acceptable. The industry was changing. And uh, if I may jump ahead, did I answer your question here? Oh, sure, sure, yes, sure. I if I may continue with this, we had proposed to David to set up a development company around him because we knew that he was working like a slave and we wanted to bring some normalcy to his life, give him some thinking time for being able to produce more product from a design perspective rather than doing all the grunt work with coding. But for whatever reason, he was uncomfortable with that. In the end, as, as if I look back on this, it turns out that that's just, you know, have, putting a company around David was just not something that David wanted. Um, I think ultimately he had to do it. He created Heuristic Park and created a few products for a bunch of other publishers out there. But um, it really didn't go anywhere. Uh, and I'm not trying to slight David. I still think of him as a as a wonderful product guy. Incredible. He's a savant. Um, but uh, but he yeah he was responsible for relaunching the Wizardry series because by then Robert had had enough. Andrew wanted to pursue his own direction as well. And uh, Norman and I felt that there were still we still had some energy. To, to continue the series, and so we did with number six and number seven. Uh, this interesting phase in the the games industry, because I guess until this point, 
a lot of GAN developers or designers like uh, David Bradley, were, I, I kind of think of them as novelists today. So they pretty much yeah. had complete control of their vision. Yeah. Suddenly, they're, you know, I can imagine Stephen King, for example, and somebody coming to him and saying, okay, now you're going to work with you know six, seven other other writers, and yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's going to be character specialists and all this kind of thing. I mean, I could see how that would just be really bewildering and you'd feel like you lost control. Yeah. I mean, do you think something is lost when in that transition? Oh, you bet, Matt. I mean, you've really hit the nail on the head here. I, I think there's a whole lot of that. But, you know, if you really want to be producing great product, you have to adapt with the times. Times were changing. And I don't know. We... There was quite a quite a bit of distance between David and, and I. We were in upstate New York. He was down in Atlanta. Perhaps if we had our office in Atlanta, it would have been easier because we could have handled a lot of the business parts of it for him, and he could have then come in and and led it, led the design group and the development group. But the, geographically, we were just not set up that way. We ultimately did set up our own development company out of Ottawa, eh, Ottawa, Canada. And, um, and it was the right decision. It was fundamentally responsible for, for developing Wizardry 8. It produced Jagged Alliance, the whole series, produced Nemesis. It did a lot of the localization work that we needed for our products for Europe, we were catering to six or seven different foreign languages at this point. Um, yeah, so we needed that de in-house development capability, and it was forced upon us through the advent of the CD-ROM. So anyway, I know I just jumped from three, six, and seven to something different. Sorry about that. But uh, if you want to come back to number eight, let's or number seven or six, let me know. <laughs> Uh, well, just a little question in between, you know, if yeah. I may ask. Wondering how you ended up with Realms of Arcania, and if you knew, uh, you ever get to meet Guido, Guido Hinkle. Guido, Guido, good old Guido. He's a great guy. Uh, yes, I did meet him. I met him several times. Um, at the point, let's see, this was 90, 92, 93, around there, I think. Um, we were selling our products to a distributor in Bing, Bingham, Bing, Binghamton, can't remember, somewhere in England, let's just leave it like that. And uh, we had a distributor there selling our, reselling our products there, and Guido was also selling his products to the same distributor. And it was at this distributor who said, these guys are looking for a place to import their products into the, into the United States. Perhaps you guys should be talking to them. And, and we, did, we did, we got in touch with them. So we, we flew to Germany where they were based and met with Guido and his crew. And, uh, and, and he had great product. It was kind of a weird name. It was product that was developed around a franchise called, translated from German to English, it's called the Black Eye. Not exactly what I would name a product, but that's okay. Maybe there was something lost in the translation. We'll have to talk to Guido about that. But... Uh, but at any rate, that's what it was. It was beautifully built stuff. Keto was the coder behind it and a design, game designer. And, and we brought it into the country. We made some changes uh, and, and launched it. It did okay. So I think that brings us up to the Jagged Alliance series. So what's the origin behind this? You said it was out of Canada, actually. Uh, Ian Curry was the creator of this one. Um, now... We had some working history with Ian already. He had released, he, we had released mainly in OEM format. OEM meaning we cut deals with some of the hardware manufacturers like Compaq and Dell. I don't even know if the Dell was there. He may, they may not have been around at the time. But we cut deals with hardware manufacturers to include this product that Ian created, which we called Freakin' Funky Fuzzballs. Do you remember that one? Freaky, freaky funky fuzzballs. Huh? Freaking funky <laughs> Freaking. fuzzballs. Weird name, but it did the job. That was by far, in terms of unit sales, 
our largest volume seller. Wow. The one that nobody has ever heard of because it was an OEM product. At any rate, Ian was the creator of that. It was a wonderful little maze game. We got to know Ian. We started a dialogue about creating another game. I remember some of the early concepts for the what ultimately became Jagged Lions. We said, huh, maybe we should create a game that would be like a newspaper route. Guy who would start a newspaper route and build a business from there into this mega media empire. That was the idea behind it. But we didn't think that it had the kind of legs needed at the time with because so much of products that you build are based on on the times. What's going on? What's what's current in the news? What what's what are the issues of the day? And I remember that there were war sabers being rattled. So we said, why don't we create more of a military theme on this? And Ian said, yeah, that's a good idea. Or maybe it was his idea that we should go down the military theme route. Whatever it was, we both agreed that this was the way forward. And that's how Jagged Alliance was born, sitting around some of the uh, tables in our production department in our main office where we cranked out. We, we had full control of production, producing our own video games. We didn't job it out because we wanted to make sure that the quality and integrity of the product was there, included, including, you know, when we were actually manufacturing. So we're sitting around with all these computers around us, and we had all these high-volume um, uh, copying machines cranking at the time. All these other products were sitting around talking about this stuff and ended up with this military theme. And he went back and created some prototypes. We worked fairly closely with Ian. We put a company around Ian at this point in Ottawa. And um, uh, it, it was a successful franchise. To this day, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's considered to be uh, um, a real jewel out there. Cult, cult product-like stuff. Um, you know, I could tell you also, we were in Las Vegas promoting this product. Uh, we often exhibit at the Consumer Electronics Show and at the E3 uh, shows uh, in Los Angeles. Well, we were in L.A., and uh, Ian was there promote, helping us promote the product because it was launching in a couple of months. And uh, I remember he must have met my sister uh, they, because they eventually started dating. And uh, I remember telling my sister, you better be very careful. This is, a, this is an important guy. You know, we, we want him to, to run our development company. And if you're going to mess this up, I'm not going to be happy with you. <laughs> so anyway, it worked out because the two got married. And, uh, and everything went happily ever after from there. But, uh, you know, from the, the Ottawa, Canada development office, developed Jagged Lines, Jagged Lines 2. There was also some sequels in between called Deadly Games and Unfinished Business. Uh, and these products really, um, really are well-known cult-like type products. They're, it's all quality. They're, this one is a good quality product. It was a little, I'm um, jumping around a little bit again on you. When we launched this product to market, three months before we launched, uh, Microprose released XCOM. All right, I was going to bring that up. I remember Brenda yeah. talked about this too. Just really <laughs> awful coincidence. What a, what a heartbreaker! You know, two products that were similar released around the same time. I think at the end of the day, the market has proven ours was a better quality product. But Microprose had a larger budget. They were a publicly funded, publicly you know, like a public company at that point with hundreds of millions, tens of millions, whatever it was. Bill Steely, the lucky bugger he was. Anyway, and I like Bill. Bill's a great guy. Bill, really interesting character. Uh, but at any rate, they had the marketing budget. They were able to make it uh, a bigger hit, and it was hard to compete when they had three months head start from us. So we were a little overshadowed, but at the end of the day, uh, our product was the better one because it so it continued to sell. It was considered to be evergreen product, meaning that even when we stopped marketing the product, it continued to sell because the product 
it's just good product. I might cheer you up. I, I actually bought a copy of it from goodoldgames.com the other day, so it's still you know still being sold. Really, it's pretty vast right. quantities even even today. Holy. So you know, you brought up Las Vegas and these consumer shows, and I just have to ask, you know, so did Sirtech ever employ these uh, booth babes to help sell product? Let me think. I don't think so. But you know, we did have the Green Lady ad. That caught everybody's attention. You know about that? Green lady ad. No, you might have to, to fill in the details for me. There are not many details to fill in. But there <laughs> weren't many details on this green lady. <laughs> we had actually. I, I assume this is not environmentally friendly lady. Well, not exactly, no, but it was a pleasure to look at. <laughs> we, uh, we had an ad company in Ottawa, Canada that helped us put our ads together and they came up with this idea that we would hire a beautiful model paint her green and uh barely put anything on her but enough to allow our ads to run in national publications and um i don't remember exactly what the what the slogan was on the ad but it didn't matter because most people remember it for a whole lot of other reasons. <laughs> and we were selling, uh, we were selling, it was a wizardry ad, I think. I think it was, maybe it was a Jagged Alliance ad. I can't remember now. It was selling one of our top products. But that was the closest thing we came to a booth babe. <laughs> so I had a question here about a 1998 interview you did. And you were talking about how uh, you thought the games industry was really getting unhealthy at the time, and a lot of that had to do with Hollywood. Uh, so I was going to ask a question, but then I got a fan-submitted question along the same lines, and I thought I actually liked his question better than mine. So this is Cody Conior. hope I'm getting his pronunciation right. But he says that uh, he's talking about the same interview. So he says, you predicted that Bethesda and other second-tier developers would be gobbled up by bigger companies. Uh, the very next year, one of the founders of Bethesda started ZeniMax, although I think that protected Bethesda from what was to come uh, rather than influencing it in a negative way. Uh, so here's the crux of the question. So if your 1998 self had seen this 2014 future, would you have felt that things had improved or that things had gotten worse? One of the reasons we got out of the industry is because we didn't like the direction of the industry. Um, I remember when Hollywood first made an attempt to get into the business in the late 80s, we saw them messing up. They didn't study it well. They, didn't understand, they, they should have hired people that were in it. They should have, in other words, bought companies and, and used that, that talent that built the industries. But they didn't. They wanted to just come in, release products in the way that they felt it was, you know, their, in their own way. And, and they screwed up and they left within a couple of years or even less than that, a year or 12 months after total failures, they were gone. But I knew they would be back because this industry was just developing into a part of, uh, you know, a culture icon within, within America. It was just becoming such an important uh, artistic form of expression. So uh, when they came back a second time, they were a little more precise about how they went about it. They started buying shelf space, and that drove up the prices to get my products onto, onto, the, onto the street. Before, we would sell product, and the store would make money out of those unit sales, and everybody was happy. Now the industry was shifting from making money on unit sales of the actual software products to stores making money on what you call um, marketing media packages. They would come to us and say, we'll buy X number of products from you, but we want you to buy into our marketing plans, end caps, uh, national sales flyers that will cost tens of thousands of dollars. And often they wouldn't buy enough product to justify that purchase in the marketing end cap or the national sales flyer. And so it became a little bit of a negotiating game. Why was this going on? Because when you finally sold them the product, 
they would lost leader at because they were making their money on these marketing programs they were selling to publishers. And part of it also what is lost buying, lost leader? What is that? Lost leaders. Well, exactly. That's the term used. Lost lost leadering a product. I mean, what what does that mean? I'm Oh, it's, so it means uh, selling the product for less than what you paid for it. So ultimately, you were, your profits were not in selling unit like boxes. Your profits were in selling uh, ads, shelf space, um, uh, whatever, like in these media flyers that they would have. You see them in the, the newspaper circulars, if you open up. There used to be all sorts of things from Egghead Software, for example, uh, one of the older chains, one of the early players in the video game industry. Um, and you'd see all kinds of little boxes being advertised, video games being advertised for X dollars. Well, those ads were paid for by the publishers, not by the, you know, not by the retail chain. They had to buy that stuff, and it was very expensive. And they made all their money through this type of stuff, in part. I just how I mean how how is any company I mean the retailer sounds great for them but I mean how are the publishers <laughs> supposed to make any any profits with this model? You just had to have a hit that would turn enough units to be able to make up the costs of those media campaigns, and it became more complex because you had to buy these things and commit to these things six months in advance of knowing when your product was ready for shipping. So you're committed to this marketing plan, and if, a, if your development house was unable to create a product that, that was good and, and operational, for it to ship at the same time these ads displayed, you're screwed. So you have all this money in marketing, but the product isn't on the, sh isn't on the street. That's a bad scenario. And if you don't get the product to the street before the end of these this this marketing blitz, this commitment, then they don't take take your product. They said you missed the window. It was insanity. So I think during that day, you also found a lot of buggy product or half-built product because publishers didn't want to lose this money or the window of opportunity to put it on the shelf. So I didn't like the signs of any of this. I felt that to play this negotiating game, you had to be a larger player. That's when a lot of publishing companies started consolidating. Sierra Online started to gobble up a lot of companies, and they did it very successfully. They became a very huge player and ultimately so, sold their, their company. I don't know. I can't remember what it was renamed to, but... They ultimately sold it to the holding company that owned Avis Car Rental. And, um, you know, that's the size that they grew to. And they did this primarily to negotiate decent deals, reasonably balanced deals with these large chain stores that were now dictating marketing terms because their business model had changed to making money on these media things, not on unit box sales. So I didn't like the signs of that. I knew consolidation was coming. Um, we didn't participate in the consolidation for a number of reasons. But, uh, you know, I just didn't like the signs of it. So we, we wound our, our company up quietly. In retrospect, do you wish that you had consolidated? Are you happy with the way things turned out? I don't know that there's anything... I don't know that I'm happier one way or another. It is what it is, and uh, we did what we did, and we felt that that was the right thing to do. You don't kind of look back on this one. You just, uh, you know, it would have been nice to be able to sell it for some good bucks, but we didn't, and, you know, we had our day, and we're happy with that. Like I said, I only expected a car out of this thing. I'll tell you one thing, I, Robert. You definitely illuminated some... Or open my eyes to some things I wasn't quite aware of. I did a chapter about this this age that we're talking about, and I noticed that there's a whole lot of, especially CRPGs coming out at this time, just full of bugs and just almost unplayable. You know, just about killed the genre. And I, I kind of thought it was just the you know our developers getting lazy, do they not know how to handle the uh, the CD-ROM? 
you know, capacity and all this kind of thing. But it sounds like it really wasn't anything to do with them. It was just this really crummy, unbelievably uh, terrible retailer scheme. Well, it wasn't the old sole responsibility for this, but in large measure, it was dictating terms. Uh, you know that I'm sure that these developers who were trying hard to build wonderful products, and you know, developers sometimes can get ahead of themselves. They get, they they build and they build and they build and they 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 overbuild to the point where. Let me use this metaphor. When you go see a movie, it's one and a half hours. Now, sometimes you go to movies, they're two and a half hours, and you're leaving that movie hall saying, thank God it's over, right? Well, same thing happens in video games. You have a certain amount of play time in video games, in the types of products that we produced anyway, and then Richard Garriott and some of these others, like Westwood and uh, Brian Fargo's company in Exiles, building some epic product too. Um, you know, these things, you know, you have a certain window. 20 hours is too short. 40 hours may be just right. Some of the products that our company produced was 50, 60, 80, 70 hours in length. I went to them and I said, stop. This is too much content. You're going to turn people up. We had debates like this internally. So under this new business template that we were talking about with marketing pressures now happening, with the developers wanting to do more and more and more, and with people wanting to just bring realism to this whole thing, A, we need product by B date, and, and we need to make sure that we don't create too much product. We want it to be a pleasant playing experience. So there were all these dynamics going on internally, and I'm sure these guys were just saying, well, if you need it by X date, you're going to get a buggy product. Well, faced with hundreds of thousands of dollars of marketing commitments, I guess you're going to ship buggy product, and that's what they did. We didn't like that, and we didn't, but it was hard work. We pulled several all-nighters to, to, you know, crazy hours to get stuff done in time for, for market. Do you still see this going on today, or do you think things have gotten better with all of the digital distribution oh i online. think it's a lot better now uh you know digital distribution changed everything uh we i saw that one coming too apple was one of the leaders in digital distribution through their itunes product line right um and uh and that's why i'm sure steve jobs was so hell-bent about keeping i uh, remember napster was threatening his uh integrity of the itunes product line and and I think at that time, Steve Jobs knew that he was going to use this as a major revenue source because this digital distribution was becoming pretty evident. That was going to be the way of the future. It was just a question of when. Uh, and you wanted to time that one right. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot better now because you can launch product without these heavy marketing campaigns. It's still, you know, it's not entirely true. You still need to advertise it. You, you need to get the word of mouth out there. You need to. You need to do stuff, but it's at least you don't know, have these these windows like you did when you're buying shelf space. It was either deliver it now or sorry, you're out the door. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the final installment of this interview with us, Mr. Robert Sirotek. And yes, that is where he talks about Mr. Cleave. So uh, stay tuned for that. All of you guys have been waiting very anxiously for that. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, happy birthday is in order to Keith Hearns. And then a little bit of news from the Matt Cave. Uh, not too much this week. Uh, but the most interesting thing is that Michael Thomason, who I believe actually watches this show, I know I've interacted with him over email a few times, but anyway, it's pretty cool that he's uh, sold his lifetime accumulation of consoles and games uh, for $750,000 at a Game Gavel option, uh, auction. <laughs> it's kind of mind-blowing to me that uh, he got that much. Uh, apparently he had 11,000 games and 100 consoles, and he built this collection up over the years. He's, he dedicated $3,000 or allocated $3,000 per year to buy games and consoles with and apparently he's had some kind of family situation and he had to sell it all off but anyway if you got to sell it off I'm really glad that he made that much money so uh, congratulations to Michael Thomason 
Okay, I think that's it for the news. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much, guys. If you have supported me in my efforts at preserving video game history, you guys are just awesome, man. Uh, if you want to uh, join the uh, the rest of those uh, guys, uh, just go to the link in the bottom of the show notes. There's a Patreon link there. Uh, basically, it lets you set up a subscription, so uh, you can set it to whatever amount you feel comfortable with, a dollar per episode, five dollars per episode, or whatever you feel uh, comfortable with. You can also set a maximum monthly budget, too, which is pretty cool. So if you don't want to go over five dollars a month, uh, that's very easy to do. But anyway, I really appreciate it, guys. It means a whole lot to me. Also, a uh, big thanks to everyone who's uh, been retweeting uh, the episodes and posting it on Facebook or your your blogs or whatever. And by the way, if you do mention the mention the show on your show, if you have a YouTube channel, uh, please let me know about that, uh, and then maybe I'll mention that uh, your channel in the news from the Mad Cave. So a little mutual, you know, reciprocal uh, <laughs> uh, gratification there, I guess. All right, let's see. What about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a Moylan's Hopsicle Imperial Ale, a triple hoppy. This is brewed by the Moylan's Brewing Company out of Novato, California. Alcohol 9.2% by volume, so that's about twice what you get from most beer. And let's see if they say anything here. Apparently this has won a whole bunch of awards uh, worthy of a king's imperial court. Enjoy the blast of fresh tomahawk, chinook, and athenum hops as they stimulate the taste buds in a truly imperial fashion. Pucker up. You know what I think about drinking an ale? Uh, puckering is not usually the first thing that comes to mind. But anyway, let's get this thing open and see what this triple hops is all about. All right, so I've been sniffing this uh, Hopsicle Triple Imperial Ale, or Hopsicle Imperial Ale Triple Hoppy. i try to get the name right. It smells really good. You smell a lot of... Uh, Almost like a coffee-like aroma to this. A lot of cherry. You can definitely smell the hops in it. Uh, but anyway, let's give it a taste. <coughs> uh, quite strong, uh, this ale is. I guess I'm not surprised. They give them like almost 10% alcohol. You definitely uh, taste the alcohol in this one. No mistake in that. Uh, it's very bitter. Very bitter. Very, <laughs> very bitter. Uh, sort of a cherry on top. Uh, of the flavor here. So you sort of get bitterness followed by the sweetness of the cherry. That sort of coffee-like, almost like a real strong coffee uh, flavor to this. Let me try it again. Uh, yeah, just that, that alcohol is just like slapping me in the face every time I drink this. Uh, definitely not something for the casual drinker, you know. <laughs> you need to have an acquire taste for something like this, which is generally achieved by two or three uh, sips. Let me try it one more time. Ugh. Yeah, this one's just really getting to me. Uh, Hopsicle Imperial Ale, definitely not for the faint of palate. Not really the flavor combinations I go for. Like I said, I'm really tasting a really strong cherry, uh, chocolate, bitter coffee-like uh, flavor to this. Not exactly my cup of ale. But, you know, if you like that sort of thing, you might really love this. I'm going to go three out of five drinking horns on it. Uh, definitely interesting. Uh, if you want to <laughs> really test your palate, I guess this one might be a good choice. But uh, it's a little bit on the bitter side for my taste. So three out of five drinking horns. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for stuff about marketing. And I found, a, I thought, a really relevant quote from Edwin Land. It goes something like this. Marketing, <coughs> excuse me. Marketing is what you do when your product is no good. See you guys next week. I can't explain this.